let's talk about um, you know, where you think morality comes from. So in the religious view, obviously, there, there are certain things that I believe are capable of understanding by any sentient human being. So I don't believe that all human beings in the absence of religion are immoral people who go around murdering their neighbors and, and raping their sisters. Uh, I think that, yeah. that, and in fact, this is pretty well embedded in even Judaic philosophy, the idea that there is a sort of natural law theology where you as just a normal person know not to kill people and know not to steal and know to set up courts of law. This is what they call the seven, the seven commandments to Noah. Um, but the idea is that anyone can basically discover these things. And there are universals across culture about you're not supposed to murder your brother. Um, but the, the biblical reading is that to reach a more sophisticated level of morality that leads to a sort of right-based society we see here, you at least need the, the catalyzing enzyme of, of a, Judeo, a Judeo-Christian religion in order, in order to get here. That, that would, I think, be the, the most rationalistic argument on behalf of Judeo-Christian values. Hey, but, but where is here again? Uh, here would be a civilization that values individual rights above the values of the collective uh, that, right. that says that, that people are to be treated, to use the biblical phrase, as made in the image of God, that we should treat individuals as made in the image of God, uh, that, that that does not happen in the absence of a Judeo-Christian value system. That's, that's the religious argument. Uh, so the, right. and, and which Although is, that is more of a historical argument. That, 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 right, that, that's what I'm saying. It's a rationalistic argument because the, the, the deeply religious argument would be God said so, so do it, right? But that's not the argument that, I think is the most compelling because that only works if you believe in God and if you believe in revelation. So that's not the argument that I tend to make because I, I don't find it intellectually convincing. It's an argument from authority, which of course is not particularly convincing. So I tend to make the historical argument, which is that history brought us to, that, that the reason we are at this point in history is because without that particular catalyzing enzyme, you don't get what you have here, which is why the West and Western civilization crop up in a Judeo-Christian system but don't crop up in, for example, Islamic countries, and Islam's been around for a thousand years. So, what do you, number one, what do you make of that argument? And then I want to get into, so, where you think morality comes from. Right. Uh, well, a few points. I mean, one, I, I'm not convinced by that historical argument. I think you can, you can cherry-pick the data either way and come up with, with a different con- conclusion. And the, even if I agreed with it, it wouldn't make the case I think you want to make because it would be an instance of a, what's called the genetic fallacy, which is if we, even if we granted that, that our respect for individual rights, say, came from a Judeo-Christian tradition, it doesn't mean that it can only come from, from there or that it even is best gotten from there. Uh, and, I, and I would say that it, it actually hasn't come principally from there. And there are many ways, like, so if, for instance, you could say that that Christianity in particular was responsible for, in part responsible for the fall of the Roman Empire, right? So, the, so Christianity undermined uh, the notion that the, 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 the Roman emperor was uh, a god. You know, it, it made it harder to recruit true soldiers and they had to farm it out to mercenaries. And, you know, it eroded, you know, uh, what you might call traditional Roman values. And then, you know, the Western Empire fell and, you know, we, we ushered in the Dark Ages. Uh, and insofar as there was a reboot to civilization at that point, it was largely the result of classical, the, the learning and, and the philosophical insight of antiquity being preserved by, of all people, in the, the, in the Islamic world. world right. right. So uh, I think it's, you can, you can have it any way you want looking at history, but it just doesn't get you there in terms of the, the moral content and, the, and in this case, you know, the political or, or social content coming from the Bible or, or any other religious text. So then why, then why here? Meaning like why in Judeo-Christian civilization, civilization but not Islamic civilization? Because you mentioned rediscovery yeah. of Aristotle and, and reuse of Aristotle in 10th and 11th centuries was really beginning you know, in, in the Islamic world long before Aquinas really repopularized it in the, in the 13th and 14th centuries. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, I, I think it's, you know, from my point of view, it's impossible to ignore the influence of Islam. I mean, Islam is its own ideology and set of dogmatisms that are inflexible and at odds with the spirit of science in, uh, fundamentally. And despite the fact that there was a brief period where there seemed to be some you know, happy convergence between scientific and mathematical insight and Islam, for the most part, Islam has been hostile to you know, a real intellectual life. And in, in a way that Christianity was hostile, even when uh, uh, the scientific worldview was was struggling to be born in in you know the, the 16th century mm-hmm. and the 15th century. Uh, the uh, what what we have historically is 
a, war, a real war of ideas. And I mean, I mean, just you know, just you can be crystallized in the moment where you know Galileo was shown the instruments of torture and put under house arrest by people who refused to look through his telescope. Right. I mean, so that was the genius of religion paired with the with the emerging genius of science in that room. Well, to be fair, I mean, yeah. Galileo was originally sponsored by the church and so is Copernicus, but the but the yeah. but, but, but there's but no only, question there's yeah, a backlash yeah, from the church to this stuff. Yes, and, no and, the, but, and the backlash makes sense because there is a intellectual progress on questions of, you know, just, you know, how the cosmos is organized or where it came from or how life began. Uh, you know, all of these questions uh, are the, the the scientific answers to which are are, are in zero sum contest with the, the doctrines found in the books. Now, there it's true that there are religious people, and now even the Pope, who have relaxed their adherence to tradition enough to make room for something like evolution, right? But it's still it is still a problem. Not, not a super new idea. I mean, right? Uh, uh, Aquinas was talking about this in the 13th century and 14th century. The the idea that uh, that if it was in science and it was contradicted by the book, then you're misreading the book, right? I mean, that's 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 a pretty old idea. Yeah, yeah in, but that, but that is to world. subvert science rather than the book in Aquinas's case. I mean, Aquinas thought heretics should be put to death, right? His argument for for that for for capital punishment for heresy, and Augustine made the same argument. He thought Augustine uh, thought they should be tortured, right? So that those two great lights of the Catholic Church gave us the Inquisition and gave us you know, more than a century. Well, I think it's things. also fair to say that they were rather instrumental in the development of modern science. So the, the, the Dark Ages, no. uh, first of all, I think the Dark Ages mm-hmm. are, are a bit of a, a, an exaggeration in terms of the Dark Ages themselves had, saw a, a, massive, a massive growth in technology and architecture, for example. I mean, Gothic cathedrals are built during the Dark Ages. But, oh, sure, sure. But the, yeah. but, yeah, the, but that's, the that's, scientific, that's the scientific science. world is, well, Virtually every major university in the Western world was sponsored by the Catholic Church, and I'm not yeah, I'm not yeah. a great Catholic defender, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but no. but virtually but the, all but major universities were yeah. sponsored by the Catholic Church, which saw consonance between science and religion as a reason to actually investigate the natural world. Well, no, I mean, I think again, I think that's backwards. I, I think the reality is, is there was no. I mean, everything that was good that was done anywhere at any time prior to you know pick your year was done by some religious person. I mean, there was just nobody else to do the job, right? So you could you could make the argument that. You know, Catholics built every bridge in Europe until the Protestants came around and they, they built their half of the bridges. I mean, so there was just no one else to do the job. Uh, and we're human beings who want to uh, pursue various ends, many of which require breakthroughs in learning. So, you know, is engineering got born in a religious context. Physics was, you know, the first physicists were people who were who were Christians, who were, you know, we had, you know, as is often pointed out, Newton spent half his time worrying about biblical prophecy. Now, I think that was a waste of, an objective waste of <laughs> his time. He also spent you know, a lot of his time worrying about astrology, right? So you're, you're trying to- Alchemy, make, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, and, and alchemy. And, um, and alchemy, insofar as there was anything to it, apart from sort of the, kind of the internal myth-making that may be of use to some people, be edged into chemistry, right? So, like, so it, there, was, there, was, there was often a real science at the back of a lot of merely mortal confusion where people were trying to work things out. I, you know, I would argue very much under the, the shadow of religious commitments that they need not have had and were not actually serving their, their ultimate ends. Uh, and so, and this, this for me is true in the moral sphere as well, because so to take, this is why the Bible, in my view, can't be the, the real repository of our moral wisdom in any sense, because when you go to read it, you are forced to ignore certain passages or reinterpret them rather aggressively to conform to what you now in the 21st century have every reason to believe is good or a direction worth going socially. So, you know, it, it is just an inconvenient fact that slavery is endorsed in the Bible. It's, it's explicitly endorsed in the Old Testament, and it's it's certainly not repudiated in the New, right? And, you know, Jesus told you know, slaves to serve their masters and to serve their Christian masters especially well. So there's no place in the Bible uh, where you can get a, a truly compelling case against slavery because the creator of the universe clearly expected slavery to be a human institution. Well, except for abolitionists finding enough inspiration in the Bible they, to use it as did their that main despite, text. Yeah, but they, dis- they did that despite what's in the Bible. Well, I think, I think that that is, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, this, this shouldn't sound insulting because it's not meant as an insult. I think that from a religious point of view, that's, an ins- that's, that's a simplistic reading of the Bible's role in, in human affairs. Meaning that when 
any written document is given to any group of people. It has to be given to people in a way that they can understand. It's not that slavery was endorsed by the Bible. It's that slavery is universal among human civilization until it, modern it, times. But it was no, no. There were certainly there are religions that have different points of view on all these questions, right? So it was possible in the fifth century BC to have a, a take on ethics with respect to something like slavery uh, or the killing of you know combatants or non-combatants. Um, that was quite a bit more modern and ethical and 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 civilized uh, than was found that is found in the Bible. So I mean, you take take I mean, you might not like some of their other commitments, but take something like Jainism, right? I mean, Jainism. I mean, Gandhi got his nonviolence from Jainism. I mean, Jainism is just in truth a religion of peace, unlike Islam, which is is you know the, the word peace is a euphemism for the word surrender there um, or submission. So uh, it's, you know, it was possible for people 2,500 years ago to, to wake up one day and even write a book which suggests don't harm anyone or anything, even a, even a cricket. Right. right. Well, that's, I mean, that's fine. But yeah. the question is, how many converts does Jainism have? Meaning that the, the point of, if you're going to give a book over, if, let's say that, let's pretend that you thought that God existed and that you, and that you were he. Uh, and it was and it was your job to convey to a group of human beings what you think morality should be, understanding that they're going to take that and develop that because we do have this gift of human reason that we use to develop things. And so yeah. there's a root text, and then it is developed over time. This is why I think Judaism is particularly kind of unique in this respect because that's been an ongoing dialectic for literally thousands of years. I mean, there's legitimately you know, thousands of pages of, of tractates of just people arguing about these particular issues. You would say that the argument should have started from the point of there was no text for them to argue about, and they should have just argued from sort of a priori well, reason, well, no, maybe. No, I, mean, but, I, I, I respect text, but I think the principle of revelation is a problem. But I, just to back up for a second, I think it's it's certainly problematic for you as a Jew mm -hmm. to argue that the legitimacy or, or success of a religion is best measured by the number of adherents in the year 2018. Right? No, but the, point, but the point of Judaism also is that the, I mean, it says in the Bible itself that God is going to make you know great peoples of all of Abraham's sons, for example. And as Maimonides put it in, in the Jewish belief, the, even the, the growth of Islam and Christianity, which are obviously based on a certain Juda Judaic root, I think Islam less so because there's an actual rewriting of the Old Testament and, and the New Testament not as much. It, Maimonides suggested that Christianity had basically been brought about as, a, as an extension of Judaism, which is the greatest, you know, Christianity is the greatest converting religion in the history of the world. Right. So the, but it seems so strange to, to count at the, the success of the success in terms of numbers well, I, I mean, of Christianity and Islam, given the, that, you know, the, the, the basic principle, the, the bottom line is the basic principles of Judaism, those have been embraced in a way that the basic principles of Jainism have not across time, and they've shaped civilizations in a way that is significantly better than the principles of Jainism have, have shifted any number of of small people, uh, or right. a small group of people, not, right. not small right. people, obviously. Well, so again, it's just the fact that you and I could improve the Bible with very little thought, just by taking out, if we just took out the worst passages that have no possible redeemable content this year, or I would argue any other year, right? The, the Bible's already improved, right? So the fact that we could edit it to anyone's advantage is a problem for the idea that this is the, was written by an omniscient being and not to be superseded by any human effort to, now or, or generations from now. Uh, and it's just not, it's a problem not just for the Bible, it's a problem for the Quran. Uh, that, and this notion of revelation is what gets us there. Now, if you're go going to treat all books as the product of just human minds, you know, brilliant or not, uh, and every shelf in the bookstore or library has the same status with respect to the, just the, the merely mortal provenance of these ideas. Then it's fine. Then you can do, then you can pick and choose the best ideas, right? And then you can be you can be slavishly attached to, you know, the Plato's Republic, and it just let, that can be your favorite book. But what Revelation gets you is this notion that no, no, this isn't just a book, right? This is this is uh, the product of omniscience on some level. And that ties your hands intellectually, because then you are forced to make these acrobatic uh, contortions around passage, passages which clearly have no good application now and didn't even have a, good, have a good application then. And when you view it from the other side, when you think about just, just, how, just how good a book would be if an omniscient being, being wrote it. I mean, that is just, it just, it's, it's very easy to see 
what could be in there that would still astonish us. I mean, or it would just be, it'd be, it's very easy to see what could be in there that would prove just based on the time of its emergence that this couldn't have been the product of merely human minds. And there's nothing like that in the Bible. So to respond to some of those points, uh, I think that the, uh, there, there was a lot there. So I'm going to try and kind of parse it uh, as we go. Uh, the, I think that one of the arguments that is made, certainly in the Talmud, is the idea that human reason is, was generated in order to help uh, reason through the Bible, basically. That the, that the Bible is not just, here it is, obey it, but it is also a, a constant conversation between God and man in the sense that there is a there is a active conversation that, that goes into the interpretation of these texts. And so what the Bible really is, is an anchor and the ship is anchored to the to the anchor, but there is still some slack in the line, meaning that it is it is not that you are now tied to this anchor at the bottom of the ocean. There's still a boat that's attached, but right. human reason is is designed in order so that you can wobble through uh, with this anchor attached to you. And if without the anchor, you end up in a land of utopianism. And I think the history of the 19th and 20th century in the Dostoevsky view uh, would be a, a good example of, of how that happens. And so the construction of alternate morality uh, that is not based on any Judeo-Christian notions can take you in any number of horrible places that are significantly worse in virtually every way than the places that Judeo-Christian religion brought you for, for 2,000 years. My argument is not that Judeo-Christianity itself, the Judaism on its own, is everything that you need, right? As an Orthodox Jew, my, my argument is not that. My argument, which if, if it were, then I wouldn't be out there caring about science or about nature, as you say. Mm. You know, people who are fundamentalists don't care about any of those things. They think everything you need to, be, you need to know is found in this particular book. I don't think I know how to fix my car from, from the Bible. Right. Um, but what, what I do think is that in the Straussian view, there's a tension between Athens and Jerusalem. There's a tension between revelation and reason. And that without either one of these things, that reason without revelation ends up in utopias of our own creation that end up in really, can end up in horrifying, horrifying places ranging from death camps to, to gulags. Uh, and that revelation without reason ends up in theocratic tyranny. And so you do need both of those in, in an interchange in order to have something that means something. And, and the reason that omniscience matters is because if there is no belief in an objective level of moral truth, then everything becomes subject to interpretation, include, up to and including, if you're intellectually honest enough, laws like murder, because maybe murder doesn't apply to people who are outside my tribe. Maybe it doesn't apply to people who are outside my family or people I just want to kill for my own benefit. So this is where we get into the alternative moral. So this is where I'm going to ask you about your moral yeah. basis. So, Wait, so let, me, let me respond to some of that, though, because sure. there's a lot there. So it's not going to surprise you that I, I disagree with, yeah. with that summary. This is the fun part, uh, yeah. So I mean, to take your anchor, uh, I think there is an anchor or at least a, a foundation to everything we can discover or, or uh, value, and it's human conversation, right? And, and, and I think the morality, because I, I think revelation it simply didn't happen, right? right. It's, all, it's, it's just human beings talking to one another at any point in history, uh, thinking internally. I mean, there's been extraordinary people, and they've had extraordinary insights, and they've shared them, and they've codified them in, in books. So the morality or pseudo-morality or barbaric morality that you find in various places in various texts was put there by people, right? It's not that it would, came from some other source and that we need to be anchored to it. It is, a, it is the record of a, a merely human conversation that, uh, I'll be the first to admit, has in various parts real value and real you know, wisdom in it. And that's and hence the reason why people are so attached to some of it, certainly. Uh, but it's just, that's not unique for the Bible that you can find that in you know, among Greek philosophers or you know, you know, in various places in antiquity. And you can find it in modern variants. I mean, you and I in, the per, in, the, in, the, in one another's presence here having a, a conversation that gets recorded, we can say something that is highly relevant to the question of, you know, how to live a good life. And if we were doing this 3,000 years ago and it happened to get written down, it would be one of the lines that people would think w w had been revealed if, if uh, uh, you know, they, they lost track of what its actual source was, you know. And so it's, it's people like ourselves that have always done this work. And so my, my the, the basic framework here is that all we have is human conversation and uh, all we can appeal to are honest efforts to get at the truth here. And the choice for me is between a 21st century conversation where we avail ourselves of all of the intellectual tools we can get in hand, and that includes whatever is good in religion, right? So if, if there's something that is in 
Ecclesiastes that is better put there than any place else in the, the canon of all of human knowledge, well, then of course we want to keep that, right? So, but so, so how do you so how do you decide what is the good? Because right now you're you're essentially playing cotty under the tree, right? You get to you get to sit there and say, here's a good moral standard, here's a bad moral standard, and you and I will sit here and our conversation will be better than a conversation a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. The, this is a question that, that I asked you actually last time we spoke publicly, uh, right. and that, that, and the question is, okay, so if if that's the case, you and I tend to agree, I would think, on probably ninety five percent of our of our central values about what it is that makes for a good life, right? Right. Th I think that we we both believe in individual freedoms. I think we both believe in the ability to to live as you choose, so long as you're not hitting anybody else in the face. As a general rule, uh, you know, I think that we we both agree on all of these things. And so what I asked you last time is. Why do we agree on these things? Is it because we just both happen to be super reasonable? Like we are just the most reasonable people who ever lived and we just happen to be here at this time and why didn't people a thousand years ago know this? Or is it, you know, back to my original argument, the fact that we grew up probably 10 miles from each other in a city that was built in a country that was built by people who believed all of these things that came from a book, half of which you think is crap from, you know, <laughs> from a thousand years before Christ. Well, so I think the environment in which we grew up, insofar as this is a product of culture, is not mostly defined by the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's mostly defined by secular politics and secular ethics that have, uh, some of which are of a piece with those religions and, and other religions. Uh, you know, something like the golden rule. I mean, the golden rule predates Christianity, certainly. It's in Leviticus, I think. Uh, and you know, love thy neighbor as thyself, in Leviticus. Yeah, and it all, but it, it, it's not unique there, too. I mean, right. there, there, right. you know, there, there are Greek philosophers, I think uh, Epictetus uh, articulated it someplace. The truth is, it predates our humanity on some basic level. You can see evidence of it in monkeys, right? There's, a, there's an expectation of fairness, even in monkeys, right? So, this is a, um, we're running a, a software program that, that is morally relevant to us, uh, that is riddled with bugs, but that predates our humanity. And so we are, so largely what civilization is, what, uh, the, the, the good parts of culture that, that will lead to something that is, that is durable at the level of civilization, uh, largely correct for our merely hominid, merely evolved, merely creaturely, moral intuition. So for instance, like you, know, like you and I have as you know, front and center in our moral hardware, a sense of disgust, right? And, and disgust is, disgust has roots below anything that could be considered moral. It's just, you know, you, right. you, you can smell something bad and you feel like vomiting and that's, the, so, but the, the truth is in, in terms of the evolution of the brain, the, the brain doesn't evolve new modules that can do fundamentally new things. It has to evolve uh, capacities that are predicated on the old hardware that was anchored to things like, you know, the, uh, I'm going to vomit based right. on that smell, right? right? And uh, much of our moral thinking about the world is disgust-based or fear-based, and um, uh, it's it gets applied to things like how you feel about gay marriage, say. So you, if you go into a you know, Bible-thumping fundamentalist Christian context where you, you can find people who are just adamant that gay marriage is wrong, this discussed circuitry is tuned up through the lens of that social question. And um, that's a, so, so I view conversation about ethical truth and progress in ethical space being more a matter of uh, a re reasoning uh, and unhooking our uh, our reflexive, in this case, disgust-based intuitions about uh, from our, our sense of what is ultimately good. I mean, there, there are things that you and I might not be comfortable with the first time we consider them that we can get comfortable with by thinking it through or, or, or imagining things from other people. Or at the very least, that we think are immoral and, and but still think that we have no business in, in doing anything yeah, about. Right? Yeah, and, and ultimately, f there, there are cases of kind of moral dumbfounding where you would you would have to admit that it's 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 moral in the sense that that you you can't point to a victim, right? And right. Yet, Jonathan Haidt talks about experiments like this, like yeah. somebody who's you know having sex with a dead chick. But it still like, disgust, <laughs> right. it disgusts you. Like, or right. I mean, to take it out of the moral sphere for a second, if I told you, well, I have um, I have Jeffrey Dahmer's sweater. You know, it's been dry cleaned. Would you like to? <laughs> would you Would you try it on? Right now, everyone recoils from that. Right. right? But it's not. If you actually think about it. 
it's not something that she, it's like there's kind of a magical uh, superstition intrude in there where you right. think that's something that's been deposited in the sweater even though you know we we uh, dry, dry cleaned, cleaned it. it you know 450 <laughs> times right um, so it's uh, and if maybe a sweater is too charged but to take something that it, where you, there would be absolutely no question that Hitler's his DNA harmonica. it's not yeah, covered exactly. with his this creepy guy's <laughs> DNA it's uh, it's something that you just in order to recoil from it, you are you are right. thinking superstitiously, right? So you can you can correct for those. So you're moves. making a sociobiological explanation for morality, like basically is an E.O. Wilson explanation for the evolution of morality. No, I, well, so I so to the contrary, I think that there are two very different ways to talk about morality with respect to, to our scientific understanding of ourselves. One is what you just referenced this this biological evolutionary descriptive story of how we got here you know why is it that we're the sort of apes that feel this, these sorts of ways about social interactions say right and and, and why is, is is our moral thinking anchored to those uh, properties then there's a completely separate question which is the question that that interests me morally which is given what we are given where we are right now what is possible for us? What, how good could human life be? And what are the principles of you know, neurobiology and everything else, economics and sociology and genetics, uh, anything that can be brought to bear to change human experience? What are the, the, the principles whereby we can navigate in the space of all possible experience and experience better and better lives and, and a better and better world? And so that's, and that's, that is a very different question because it, 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 presupposes, just on its face, that we have to, most, most of our job is to fly the perch that has been prepared to it. Right, and I evolution. think you and I agree on this, but I'm not sure why. Okay, so here are the, I think, the two big questions that, that I have. One is, where does your concept of the good come from, and why is it universal? Um, and two, you just spelled out sort of your differentiation from the, the sociobiological explanation for morality that we evolved over time, and that our brains are evolved to perform certain tasks, and we sort of naturally came to a, a level of morality, but you're not a believer in free will. So, what, so when you talk about reason uh, and you talk about you know, the importance of reason, you and I fully agree on this, but my question is that as a neuroscientist, if we are just pure material and we're just a bunch of neurons firing outside of our own control, obviously, because every, cause ha every effect has a cause, if it's just things happening, yeah. then why should we value reason? Does it matter that we value reason? Uh, because we can't control whether we value reason anyway. Uh, are these conversations kind of pointless? Because no, what, no, yeah, no, yeah. or and, and then back to the first question: How exactly does reason play into the good? Is that just a vague term for a particular system of neurons that convinces another particular set of neurons? Right, right. So two questions there: What what is right. the foundation of value and and morality specifically, and how does free will or its absence interact here? So I mean, so the foundation for me is. Uh, and this is where this connects to other questions where we our intuitions probably divide. I mean, the questions about you know what is the meaning of life, what is the purpose of life. Those are questions that people ask, where religious people, uh, by and large, feel like you need an answer. Like there's a, there's a there's a meaning shaped hole in the world, and we should fill it. Um, and I, given how I th view things, think it's the wrong question. But I mean, what, what I see us as having is an opportunity. Like we we are in a circumstance where. Based on the minds we have, there is a range of possible experience, and we don't. And the horizon goes in both directions, to the very, very bad and the very, very good. And we don't quite know how bad things can get, but based We've on what we know, close, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know they can get far worse than we ever want to touch. And so it is with the good. We don't know how good things can get, uh, and yet we know the general direction where we want to head. So we, we know that if the world becomes more and more characterized by love and joy and creativity and compassion and insight and uh, fun, and we know that's all, that whole suite of, of and we could, we could, you could list that, list those characteristics uh, as long as you want, but there's a, a kind of jewel with a thousand facets that we want more of as conscious entities. And there's a there's a, a far darker jewel with as many facets that we want far less of. And this this spectrum admits of seeming paradoxes, which are, you, you, we could both point to occasions where 
suffering has led to something good, right? There's a silver lining to certain kinds of pain, right? Or you, you know, if you want to become a Navy SEAL and, and f- experience all the empowerment that comes with that, you have to go through the, the hell of becoming a Navy SEAL. And that's a test and a trial. And, um, and yet there's a massive silver lining for people who come out the other side of that. So, and yet if you could sample a person's experience in each moment through that ordeal, it might be indistinguishable from torture, right? So, but, so that's just to say that the, the, the frame around which we put certain sensory experiences matters, right? If I tell you that you know, the pain in your biceps is because you've been lifting weight so much and you're making so much progress, uh, you know, you, you'll feel one way about it. If I, if I said to an identical pain, well, you actually unfortunately have arm cancer. It's a very rare <laughs> cancer, but you've got it, right? You'd be, you would feel the, uh, the suffering attendant to that. So, uh, but all of this, these are all statements about what it's like to have a human mind. And, and again, these are, I view us as having a navigation problem. And the reason why I feel like there's a foundational claim here that need not even be argued for, that is far more... Uh, defensible than a claim about revelation or anything else so you, 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 where you might tr- try to anchor morality, is that uh, all I need is the acknowledgement that if we, if we imagine a, a universe where every conscious mind suffers as much as it can for as long as it can, with nothing good ever coming up, but there's no silver lining. So we just have a, we have a perfect hell that has been designed for every possible conscious mind. I call that the worst possible misery for everyone, right? That's bad. If the word bad is going to mean anything, it applies there, right? Now, if you're going to say it doesn't apply there, if you're going to say, well, yeah, that's kind of bad, but there are things that are worse, I don't know what you're talking about. Because, I, because by definition, this is the worst possible misery for everyone, right? So as long as you are going to acknowledge that other states of the universe are better than that, right? Then, then you've given me my continuum of better and worse. You're making a very Saint Anselm ontological argument here about the about the nature of bad, and I'm, I'm not sure that. Well, well no, no, I, you can imagine the worst island no, that you could possibly imagine. Then, no, no, it's, it's, it's very different from that because it's not. It's not to say that um, because that's clearly specious. If I if I said to you, well, um, there is a uh, there's a perfect turtle. Right. I mean, def- oh, no, I agree yeah, with you. I'm not, yeah, I'm not defending the yeah, ontological no, argument. I'm yeah, making the argument that you're sort of right. making an ontological it's argument. It's not. It, it, may, it may sound that way, but it's not. It's like it, it's, it, there is, it, it's so rudimentary. Because but, I, think that, I think that you're failing to, to define a couple of terms, meaning that, right, what? so when, when you say the worst possible suffering, do you mean physical suffering? Do you mean mental suffering? Uh, and the truth is any that, combination that's the worst combined suffering. But people willingly choose I mean, it, suffering. It's all, it's, all the, mental, it's all mental in the end. But I mean, it's all it, a matter of consciousness and its content. Right, and in, I think you're, you're I feel like you're playing a little bit of a trick when you when you sort of presuppose that we share a common definition of of suffering. I think there's certain well, things where we share a definition. Let, of, let's like, say we don't. But so let's say we have a helmet we can put on and dial in every possible conscious state for for a human brain. Right. Okay. So you can wear the helmet and I can wear the helmet, mm-hmm. and we, and you know, and we we each tune it to state you know X five fifty one right. Right. And I say, well, how do you like that? And and we, so one our, one thing that is. Uh, implicit here, although it's it's not a defeater if it's not so, but I, but I have an expectation that you and I will converge, in, uh, perhaps not on every specific state as our favorite or our least favorite, but there'll be there'll be whole families of states there that you and I will acknowledge. Well, these are all fantastic. I you know maybe I, I'm not sure which I like better than the other, but this we're like this is, this is really good. I'd like to feel more of this. And we'll converge, and based this is just based on the similarity. I mean, so how do you not end up if you're pursuing the ultimate? If there is such a thing as the ultimate possible good, and this good is what you are, how do you not end up number one in sort of the brave new world? You're drugging yourself the whole time for pleasure. It, well, that's uh, an interesting question. And, so, and, yeah. and number two, you know, this does bring to mind an essay by George Orwell uh, that was that he wrote in 1940 about the rise of Nazism, and what he basically suggested was. Why is it that everything is so good in the West? Like everything is much better in Britain than it is in Germany, and yet people are willingly joining up with this monster to go and fight. And he said, because it turns out that a lot of people don't want freedom. A lot of people don't want pleasure. A lot of people are willing okay. to forego those things in, in favor of a higher pursuit. And you see that now with literally billions of people who, like, I think that the, the Bush line that every human soul yearns for freedom, I, I don't think that's true. I think there are a lot of people who misdefine freedom or think that freedom is something that freedom is not. Otherwise, they wouldn't yeah. willingly convert into these systems. So I think that okay, but the, so it the, is a little simple. You no, know, no, but none of this contradicts the picture I'm painting. It's just that all of these things 
all of these differences among people will have explanations, and we, we, we don't yet have those explanations in hand. But so take the simplest case. You know, you and I each put our hand on a hot stove, right? Now, given our similarity neurologically, I would expect if the stove is hot enough, you and I will have indistinguishable responses, right? Mm-hmm. And if you don't, sure. if one of us doesn't have that response, there's something wrong with our, right. our nervous system. So, um, but let's just say we met somebody who had a, a different, different enough response that we even couldn't converge on the question of, you know, hot stoves are, you know, not worth touching, right? You have, some, you know, have a masochist who likes a certain kind of pain that you and I find intolerable. Now, there's an explanation for that difference between us. Now, it's a, we, there might be, an, it might be an explanation that we would have some insight into. Maybe this person has trained himself to, to, to feel this and it's, he just gets this, this massive, you know, opiate rush for, you know, it's, it's like, you know, uh, uh, in Lawrence of Arabia, you know, right. <laughs> Lawrence, I mean, apparently that's a true story about him. Uh, but that's, you know, it's a, you can train yourself to feel a different way about certain kinds of unpleasant, classically unpleasant stimuli. But again, all of this fits in a complete uh, picture that we don't yet have about just w- why it is certain minds are the way they are. So the, 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 the macro question for me is, given all the minds as they are, wh- wh- where should we want to go, both individually and collectively, and there, there are multiple. There, there may be multiple right answers to this. It's not that there's just one sort of life that is the best possible life. There's a range of different lives that, given a million years to talk about it, we might not be able to dis- distinguish which is better or worse. Like you, you know, is is Chinese food better than Thai food? Right? Like, like there's a range of differences there, which are which don't matter for better mm-hmm. or worse. It's just different, right? And and yet at the end of the day, if you really preferred one and I really preferred the other we could find some reason why that's the case. I mean, well, you might be a super taster of certain tastes on your, you know, so, so genetically. The, so. but, but, but then it's still coherent to ask, should we, like, if, if, I, if, if we could really intrude in the brain and change our intuitions about better and worse, right? If I could change your sense of the rightness of certain actions or the wrongness, we could make this additional, we could ask this additional question of whether that would be good. Because that would be a new way of navigating in the space. And this brings you to your brave new world question. So like, if it's possible to, I mean, let's say we had a, a cure for sadness, right? This, this is an example I've used before where you, uh, we have a pill that perfectly cancels the feeling of, of grief, say. So, you're, so at what point in the, after the death of a loved one would you want to take this pill, right? And the answer might be never. And you would have a reason why you know, that was the case. Uh, but you could imagine someone who's just so destroyed by the experience of grief that they just can't get their life back on track. Everyone in their life is worried about them. They're, you know, on the virtue of suicide. At a certain point, you'd say, well, let's just give you this pill and just see if we can you know, bring a little daylight in there, even if you were against the, you, using right, it for yourself, sure. right? Uh, but presumably, you wouldn't want to take it 30 seconds after your kid was run over by a bus. You know, you just see this, 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 the worst thing that's ever happened in your life happen, and then you just pop this pill and you're, you, you don't feel anything, you know, one way or the other about it, right? You're ready to go to Starbucks, right? That would be, that would be a, a complete uh, fragmentation of who you are with respect to the love you feel or f- felt for your child, right? Like, what, what does loving your child mean if upon, uh, immediately upon his or her death, you, you want to cancel felt, your right. grief and you feel great, right? So... So th- we don't know what, we, it'd be hard to find the right answer. But, and, you know, th- and this kind of thing is very likely coming, by the way, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's very likely we will one day have a cure for grief, right? And we'll fi- have to figure out how to use it. And there will be wrong ways to use it. But I think what we want, I think the intuition that, that causes you to ask this question about Aldous Huxley and Brave New World is that we, w- we have a, we're right to want to be anchored to reality in some sense. And if we, and if we were ever faced with a, an opportunity of, is uploading ourselves into a simulation where just the world is a video game and nothing nothing is real, right? So like that our, our states of happiness are totally divorced from the reality of our lives, right? And our actual relationships and the conscious experience of other people, that would be a bad thing, right? And yet we could imagine a circumstance of maximizing pleasure in a way that's divorced from reality. And that's an interesting argument to have ethically because I think that there's, I think our intuitions about that could change to some degree. And I think that there are ways in which we're already 
in something very much like a simulation that's not I mean, like to talk about what what is real in this context mm-hmm. is interesting uh, but i share i share your bias here i share mm-hmm. the sense that there are versions of brave you know pure pleasure brave new world futures where everyone's a her- heroin addict perfectly medicated that's not good right and and i think but i think you can you can adjudicate that based on other possible experiences in the landscape of all possible experiences that are clearly better. And, and you would make an argument based on, on evaluating those experiences. Okay, so uh, this is one of those episodes where it's just, I'm going to be devastated that we don't have a second hour mm. to actually go into all these issues <laughs> well, we because we, we basically scratched the surface yeah. on all of this. But uh, sort of final parting question because we didn't even get into rationality free or free will yet. exactly. Yeah. A couple places where I'm sure we have more disagreements. But, but I have a very short answer yep. to that piece. So, Perfect. So, so, okay, so, so go so, for it. So rationality, and I think I might have said this to you on stage at our event, rationality is not, a, the successful moments of reasoning are not examples where freedom of will is even tempting to, to ascribe. I mean, so, so it's, it's, if I give you an argument, if you, ha- if you strongly believe one thing, and I give you an argument that persuades you, that just knocks down the row of dominoes in your mind, that leads you to think. Right. No, I, that, I understand your argument, that, which that, is that it's a naturalistic that, response yeah, to a reasonable argument. That, and you don't that, have any control over that. But you you don't have any uh, control over over any moment where you finally see the light. So where I give reason- you a chain of reasoning and and it, and it works. You would that that's a moment where you are changed by something extrinsic to your own volition. Right? So uh, my my basic response to that is yes and no. Because you see people who clearly resist the impact of a reasonable argument well, on themselves. Uh, yeah, um, so, but, but the, the resistance is what it is to be unreasonable or to be under the sway of wishful thinking or, or confirmation. Right, but the bottom line is that, that, from my perspective, that is somebody, if, if the idea is that reason is basically just eliciting a, a particular response, then people have the capacity to override their ability to listen to reason. But, um, well, but so if you're going to ascribe that to free will, that's that's a different thing to ascribe. But that, again, I would I wouldn't, you don't need free will to explain that, but that's, that is, take the reasoning piece. If I give you a, I mean, the, the quintessential moment of it, I give you a column of numbers to add up. Right. You have zero degrees of freedom if you're going to actually be doing arithmetic. You so just, then, you, so then the question, so the final question here, because we, because yeah. unfor- we're going to have to have you in for like a four hour session here sure. and just schmooze. But sure. it's, it, but is the argument in favor of reason a moral reason is good argument? Or is the argument a utilitarian reason is useful argument? Or is it both? Because yeah, the, well, I, I can imagine yeah. a lot of ways to convince people of things. Uh, that don't involve me making arguments to them, and that historically have been used to great success with horrible, horrific human carnage. Obviously, well, well you're not necessarily convincing them in that case. You're just uh, forcing uh, them. Forcing right? them. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Although, be, although I would say that you can indoctrinate fully millions of people into particular. You would think this too, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. that it's possible yeah. to indoctrinate people not using reason into fully formed belief systems. Yeah. Uh, so is so when you make the argument for reason, are you saying that reason is morally better? And if so, why is reason morally better than, for example, the appeal of passion, which has obviously motivated millions of billions of people over time? Right. Well, I, I, again, I don't think they're as separable as many people think. I think you can't reason, and there's neurological evidence to back this up. And the, Antonio Damasio did this work decades ago, where if you have certain neurological in, injuries in the, in right. the orbital medial prefrontal cortex, you can't you can't be moved by the products of your, quote, reasoning. Because, I mean, reason has to be anchored to emotion in a very direct way. And I mean, you can actually feel this in yourself. So if, if I say something that starts to sound like bull to you, right, that feeling of doubt, you know, the feeling that you have detected errors in my tra- chain of reasoning, that feels like something. That is an emotion, mm-hmm. right? And if you couldn't feel that, you know, if it was all just cold and calculating and just... That's right, sociopaths, you know, can't reason their way to virtually anything. Well, they can. Re- well, or we can't. They, or they the actually, reverse can reason their way to everything. They, well, they, they can. They can. <laughs> they can reason fine. Unfortunately, they they just don't care about other people's experience. So they're right. they're, they're very um, they're they're very manipulative in uh, ways that you and I wouldn't. But be reason itself doesn't being. arrive at a moral answer in any case. It, well, so so for me, reason is the only thing that, as we talked about at the top of this, it's the only thing that that takes us out of who we are. And scales to some universal point of view. It's 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 not it's it's you're not reasoning. If you're actually reasoning, what you're arriving at is not just true for you. It's true for anyone who could be in. It's true from essentially above on, on any given topic. You know, it 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 does offer the view from above or the view from uh, any possible perspective, or at least it takes in the into account 
the effect of perspective. You know, so it's like if if you know, again, reason is and, and scientific rationality generally is the thing that explains why you know if you're colorblind, you don't see colors the way I do, right? And that's it, but it's it's not that we can't get at what's actually real. We can, we because we can explain divergences of opinion, and, it's, and and otherwise you just have those divergences. Well, we are definitely going to have to have you back for a, a much longer conversation. It's really a pleasure yeah, to have you sure. here. Thank you so yeah, much likewise. for folks who haven't who don't know Sam's podcast. I'm sure you do. It's Waking Up. Sam's Sam's podcast is the Waking Up podcast, and his his most recent book is Waking Up. Yeah. Uh, so so check that out. Uh, Sam, thanks so much for stopping sure. by. Really, it's a yeah, pleasure. pleasure to see yeah. You. Yeah. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer Jeremy Boring. Associate producers Mathis Glover and Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And title graphics by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.